Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. All right, do my best to garner attention here. All right, good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Tim McAfee. Dr. McAfee received his medical degree from UCSF and his master's degrees in health policy and public health from UC Berkeley. He completed his residency training right here in Seattle at Group Health, uh, now Kaiser Permanente. And he was a primary care provider there um, and he directed the Group Health Center for Health Promotion. Dr. McAfee has been heavily involved in research, public health and public policy regarding smoking cessation and other prevention issues in the United States and globally. Highlights from his very impressive career include he's been an author on over a hundred publications and he's an affiliate faculty member here at the School of Public Health at the University of Washington. He founded and served as the Chief Medical Officer for Free and Clear, an organization which developed, evaluated, and delivered telephone and web-based programs helping smokers quit to over a million smokers. He helped found the North American Quit Line Consortium. He helped found and author the World Health Organization's Quit Line Manual for low and middle income countries. And then finally, he served as the Director and Senior Medical Officer for the CDC's Office on Smoking and Health from 2010 to 2017, where he stewarded three Surgeon General's reports on tobacco. He is also an author and scientific reviewer for the upcoming Surgeon General's report on tobacco cessation that we had originally hoped um, he would be able to talk about during, during this talk, um, but unfortunately is not yet released and is currently embargoed. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. McAfee to the podium to talk to us about new evidence-based approaches and challenges to helping patients quit tobacco. Can you hear me okay? Great. Thank you, Jeffrey, for that, uh, that uh, introduction. I'm always like, I'm not, I'm not sure who's that person that they're talking about. You know? um, so it's great to be here. I'm a little apologetic that I can't actually r reveal to you the findings in this. The, the first, there have been 33, I think, Surgeon General reports on smoking since 1964. This is the first one that's dedicated to, smoke, to actually cessation, what happens when people quit and how we help them. Uh, the bad news is you can you can never overestimate how long it will take the government bureaucracy to complete something like a Surgeon General's report. But the good news is that the evidence that they use for this, uh, I'm intimately familiar with because I was a senior uh, uh, writer and reviewer for it. Uh, so I, I, I know that what I'm saying is consistent with what you'll hear about in a couple months when it finally comes out. I thought I would start um, with a, a somewhat non-traditional case example. And uh, the case example I'm gonna give uh, is, is gonna involve one of the people that was the participants in the ad campaign that I had the honor of, of, of shepherding. There were 35 uh, uh, former smokers that worked with CDC on this ad campaign. And this is the, I'm gonna start with the, the most famous one, Terry Hall. And I'm just gonna show one of her later ads. She did about half a dozen ads for this, this campaign. Um, and then I'm going to use her, uh, 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 do a twist on this for her, for uh, a case example. So at this point, all I need to do, I think, is come over here. So this is a 30 second ad about Terry Hall. And I can use her full name because her full name is known to 90% of uh, tobacco users in the United States. You can quit. For free help, visit cdc.gov slash tips. Okay, that was the most scariest part of the entire thing for me was <laughs> seeing if I could get through this. Um, so I'm just gonna, what I'd like you to do now, I'll just say around Terry, you may seem a little invasive, like what the hell were we doing taking pictures of her two days before she died in the hospital? The reason was because Terry was one of the most powerful uh, 
forceful women I've ever met. And she essentially forced myself, the director of the, the media group that did this, and, and, a, and a film crew with 20 people. She forced us to come to the hospital and film her in this. We, we weren't going to do it. We were going to cancel the shoot when we knew she went in the hospital. But she insisted on us coming and, and because she wanted people, she wanted to use her life, including her body and what it looked like, to try to convince people to see what she didn't see when she was in her 20s and 30s, which is the ravages that smoking uh, produce on the human body. Um, so what I want to do in terms of a case study is forget about what we just saw about what, what Terry looked like and just imagine that you or a colleague are seeing her when she was 35 years old, five years before she was first diagnosed with oral cancer and then laryngeal cancer. So she, she's a 35-year-old, tall, thin, well-dressed, vivacious, bright-eyed woman with a strong sense of ironic humor who presented to her physician complaining of a persistent, low-grade sore throat that has bothered her for almost five years. And this is a, an accurate summary of uh, what was going on with her when she was 35 that was just getting a little bit worse. She's otherwise without complaint other than nonspecific erythema in the back of her throat. Her physical exam is unremarkable. She's divorced with a young daughter. Now, she smoked her first cigarette at the age of 13 on a camping trip uh, and became a daily smoker when she was a cheerleader in high school. Her father also smoked, and by 18, she was smoking a pack a day. In recent years, she sometimes smokes two packs a day of doral menthol. She is, quote, not very interested in quitting, although she knows she probably should, since she has, a, especially since she has a young daughter. She tries not to smoke too much around her daughter or in her bedroom. So you're seeing her in the exam room. Uh, what would you think about? How would you approach her? You don't know that what happened to Terry is going to know has happened, but you probably will know that there's a high probability that something like this could happen to her, given simply her smoking history. I'm not actually going to ask you to do this because I got a lot of turf to cover, but keep keep that in mind because if if somebody had done a really good job in that point. All this horrible things that happened to Terry could have been avoided, um, but weren't. So let me see. Um, okay, I'm just going to do almost for fun a sort of like sub disclosure. I don't have any official University of Washington disclosures, but there were a couple things I just wanted to mention. The, the first is I'm always amazed that we get a free pass on this. You know, if, if you got the money from the government, you don't have to disclose anything because by definition you can't have, have a conflict of interest. I actually think I had a conflict of interest working for the government uh, for the past nine years directly and now indirectly because the federal government gets $14 billion in revenue from the sale of tobacco products. And there are actual policy issues where both at the federal government and definitely here in Washington state, this is a conflict of interest, uh, particularly around tobacco taxes and how they're used. Um, I had no pharmacy relationships. I did work in the quote unquote counseling industry, as Jeffrey mentioned, uh, setting up and evaluating quit lines, but I haven't done that uh, for remuneration for 10 years. But lastly, as I thought about this, I said, you know what my big conflict of interest is? It's that I have family, friends, colleagues, and patients, including uh, Terry Hall, who've been killed by their tobacco use. And it, it has a powerful emotional uh, activator for me around that, that I think I should disclose. This isn't, this isn't something I have, I'm neutral about. This is what I'm going to uh, try to cover today. Why tobacco use is important, some trends, sort of demographic epidemiology stuff that's going on. And then I'm mostly going to focus on three buckets. Uh, the, the clinical bucket, what happens uh, in an exam room, one-on-one uh, -on -one between a, a clinician and a patient what's happening and what can happen in health systems and then what we know works and what's happening in the community. And I'm gonna start with why tobacco use is important. I'm not gonna dwell on this because I know you know a lot of this, most of this. But just to remind everybody, because it's easy to forget, especially living in Washington State and the Seattle area, that there's still 34 million Americans that are smoking. Almost half a million people die every year still in 2019 from smoking. So this is not something that has gone away as a, as a major public health or clinical problem. It's still with us. One of the things that we determined really is important for motivating uh, people who smoke to quit 
is this one death equals 30 people living with a serious smoking related illness because people are much more worried about getting a serious medical disabling condition than they are about dying because they figure they're gonna die sometime. This is just the overview slide that essentially is a picture of the entire human body. And it, it indicates every disease that has been uh, determined to be caused by smoking, which requires getting over a very high causality um, bar to, to have the Surgeon General's uh, officially declare this. And it's, it's obviously much more difficult to find a condition that is not caused by smoking than to find ones that are. And again, just a reminder that uh, this also does boil down to, to attributable death as well. So this 90% uh, of all lung cancer deaths are caused by smoking. We would be, we'd be putting a lot of uh, surgeons and pulmonologists out of work if we eliminated, completely eliminated smoking in terms of the effect on lung cancer and COPD. But even cardiovascular, it's a quarter of cardiovascular deaths. Now that was, that's sort of it for what I'm gonna say about the bad news around um, the, the harm, the physical harm uh, of smoking. This is the, the very good news. We've come a long way in the last 20 years from um, 1998 when the prevalence in adults was almost 25% to 2017 when it was 14%. It's probably gone down a little bit even more. Uh, and, and the progress that we've made with youth is even more dramatic where we've gone from about 36% down to about 8%. Uh, in, so a threefold decrease in, more than threefold increase, decrease in prevalence of smoking in high school students, which is an amazing accomplishment. In California last year, it was 2%. We have been, essentially eradicated the use of cigarettes in adolescents. It has become uncool to smoke. Now that's, that's the very good news. Now there's a, a set of bad news around this. That, so it, it, there's a lot that's camouflaged that, that it's really not quite as wonderful as you would hope it is. And the first one is that there's remarkably large disparities that really some of which didn't exist before, but that now do. Um, there's a threefold difference in, in the lowest and the highest race ethnicity with Asians at 7% and American Indian Alaska Natives at 24%. Just to pick another one, uh, there's a almost a, like an eightfold difference in education level. If you've got a GED, you're 37%. If you, if you, the people in this room, uh, that educational demographic, you're at 4%. So it, it really makes a difference what, you, what the rest of your demographics are as to your probability of smoking. Another amazing thing that's happened in the last 30 years, it used to be that essentially a large fraction of Americans smoked and they smoke uniformly regardless of where they live. But we've created in the last 30 years a, a, a geographic disparity because we've preferentially or differentially um, implemented the large scale policies that we know work to help people quit smoking, to encourage them to quit smoking. And we've done that differentially around states. So it's like a huge state-based uh, experiment that's been done. And as you can see, there's a, a pocket of states uh, here in the, um, the South and the, uh, the Kentucky, West Virginia area. And, where, and it's particularly Kentucky and West Virginia. Their rate of smoking is almost three times higher than that in the lowest states, California and Utah. The other thing that has happened um, over the last, particularly the last five years, is there's been a marked diversification of tobacco products that are used, especially by young people, um, where it used to all, you know, 20 years ago, it was almost all cigarettes, maybe with a few little cigars tossed in and a tiny amount of smokeless tobaccos. But now, particularly with the introduction of e-cigarettes and the, the beginning of the introduction of these things called heated tobacco products, uh, we're seeing a transformation in the marketplace of um, what, what people are actually using. Now, just again, to go back to some good news, trying to alternate, um, there's increasingly very, very powerful good news, and this will be highlighted in the Surgeon General's report, both about uh, effects of quitting on morbidity, 
but this one just shows mortality. And there were two large studies, one done in the UK by Sir Richard Dahl, who's the same person who did the study back in the 1950s with British physicians. He followed the same cohort of British physicians for 50 years and then published this study in 2004, not looking at the effects of smoking, but the effects of quitting and found that if they, if, if they quit between the ages of 25 to 34, they basically, their survival rate was the same as if they'd never smoked. So that's great news if you quit early. Uh, we followed this up and I was a co-author on this other study uh, representing CDC with Prabhat Jha in 2013 in the New England Journal where we looked at over 200,000 US um, citizens who, um, were, who had been extensively interviewed and then got uh, death certificate data on all of them over like a seven or eight year period and then looked at um, what happened at different ages. And the good, again, the amazing news was if you quit between 25 and 34, you added 10 years to your life expectancy. But even if you quit um, but between 45 and 64, you still added six years, four years if you did it over that. So these are enormous life expectancy changes. What else can we do? Um, perhaps short of, uh, I don't know, valve replacement or a few other medical interventions that can give somebody 10 years or six years of increased life expectancy. But we don't treat it with the respect it deserves around, around like in terms of what, I, if you think about Terry Hall, if, if we had done for Terry Hall between 25 to 35, if we treated for smoking and the possibility of adding a decade or more to her life expectancy with the same precision uh, that we do other uh, conditions, it, things would have been different. So what, what do we know? And I'm, I'm mostly going to talk now about what, what we can do to make a difference in this. And this is just a summary, but we'll be going into more detail about. But basically, at the particularly the clinical level, the things that we know will make a difference for get it, helping somebody to quit are getting brief advice to quit from a healthcare professional. And by brief, we're talking 30 seconds to three minutes. If that is routinely done with a population of patients, more people will quit successfully than if that isn't done, even if nothing else is done. Uh, but more can be done if, in, in addition, people that are interested in quitting are offered counseling, either individual group or telephonic, and uh, the seven FDA-approved medications. And then the final bottom line is, we, we know it's easy for me to stand up here and say this to you guys, and you'll think it's interesting, and well, maybe I should do more of that, but that'll mostly fade, you know, after, you know, you see your first patient or teach your first class or whatever. That, but but we, what we do know is that you, there's systematic changes that can be made in the delivery of healthcare that, that routinize this, that work, uh, and will make it ha the probability of this actually happening. It's changing our behavior, not just changing uh, a patient's behavior, and just one example of that, I'll give some more, is providing uh, health insurance, uh, removing access barriers of cost by having uh, coverage. Now, I just thought, what, what, what's actually going out there? If somebody, you're a person who smokes uh, in the United States a few years ago, what would, if you quit, how did, how did that look? What did, what did you do? So first of all, by self-report, 57% of people received clinician advice to quit. Of course, the flip of that is 43% do not recall receiving advice. So that is a huge opportunity for improvement, although obviously there's probably recollection bias at play here. Um, the other one is that two-thirds of the people that made a quit attempt did not use any form of evidence-based cessation treatment. They did not use medication. They did not use any form of uh, counseling. This is actually a vast improvement over where we were a decade ago, where it would have probably been 90% of people would not have used the treatment. So we have made progress. Of those who did most used medicine and less than one in 20 used what we would consider the gold standard, which is to get both counseling and medication. So now I'm gonna dive more into the buckets. The, um, the first bucket is really what happens in the, in the exam room, what happens on a, a hospital floor, or even what happens in a dental office. Um, and the, the, uh, the, what, what we're trying to do is make some of this very small set of straightforward things happen more frequently and more reliably. And the things that we know work in this setting are brief counseling, which again can be three minutes, um, quit smoking medications, and what works better is counseling plus medications, and what works the best of all 
is a higher dose of counseling, either a little more time or, or repetitive counseling, and then using two meds at once. And I'm gonna come back to these. First, just to be clear what, in terms of the evidence that this was built on in terms of cl uh, clinical trials, counseling is a broad brush term that again, can refer to something that could happen in a, in a physician's office. It could be delivered by a physician. It could be delivered by a nurse. It can be delivered uh, offsite by a tobacco treatment specialist. Um, all sorts of possibilities for who would deliver this and the modality, whether it's done one-on-one, -on -one, if it's done in a group, if it's done over the telephone. And the components for, particularly in the, the clinician setting, are pretty straightforward and they don't require a degree in psychology or being a psychiatrist. They, they basically are just providing motivation both to quit and then to stay quit uh, by uh, giving people positive support and finding out what might, trying to locate their personal, the things that motivate them specifically as opposed to generically. Are you worried about cost? Are you worried about dying? Are you worried about the effect of smoking on your uh, four-year-old? What is your specific motivation? And then, re and then supporting them in this idea and quitting it as the gentleman to the our right of, of the guy who looks like he's not very excited about quitting uh, is physically supporting him. There are many ways that we can support people around this. And another one though, in again, in the clinical setting is practical advice. And there's probably half a dozen things that a lot of smokers don't know that are very, very simple, that simply giving them some advice like, Hey, you should, it would be very good if you're going to quit on Friday. If Thursday night you would get rid of all the ashtrays, uh, cigarettes, and paraphernalia in your house, in your car, and at your workplace, that will make it easier because you won't be tempted. Oh, that's an interesting idea I hadn't thought of. There's a bunch, there's a bunch of little things like that that can be very uh, helpful to people and the development of a, of a quit plan. Now, there's another layer of, of counseling techniques that can be done. Uh, for people who are interested in either already know how to do them because they do them in some other format or are interested in them, which are basically simplified forms of uh, things that psychologists and psychiatrists might do, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, acceptance and commitment therapy, et cetera, et cetera. But those are not needed to create a beneficial effect in the clinical setting. Okay, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, medications. Uh, there are now seven FDA approved medications. There have been seven FDA approved medications for over a decade. There may be, there's one that the FDA is now looking at that's a mouse, uh, yet another kind of me too medicine around nicotine because five out of seven of these are just various forms of nicotine. Uh, but this one is, is just in the pipeline for FDA approval. Um, I'm gonna, I, I would emphasize looking at this slide that three of these are over the counter and the majority of people that are using medications are using over-the-counter ones. And, and currently, only the nicotine, these three nicotine ones, the patch, the gum, and the lozenge are available, OTC. There's some talk about the idea that varenicline might become a, an OTC, believe it or not. Um, and the other thing, of all these nicotine ones, only the patch is long-acting. All the other ones are... Uh, short acting for dealing with urges and cravings. So what's the difference between these? What should you think about if you're trying to counsel a patient? And it's particularly challenging because the ones that are most used are OTC and most of us are less, we, we, we have less of a commitment towards understanding and encouraging proper use of OTCs than, than uh, prescription medications. But it's very important because there's little things that people can do that make these medications drastically more effective. And there are two, there are two things at the bottom of this in terms of um, what works. Really, all of the first five, um, the, the patch, the gum, the inhaler, the spray, bupropion, low-dose varenicline, and actually not on this uh, is the, the, the lozenge. They're all the same. They about between 1.5 and 2 increase in the odd ratio over a placebo. But Higher dose varenicline um, triples your 
uh, your odds ratio, and using a patch and some form of fast-acting NRT also triples. So this is a substantial improvement in, in outcomes that is underappreciated in many clinical settings and certainly by patients. So I'm gonna give you four um, large pearls about what, what we know that's relatively new, it's certainly new in terms of people's perceptions. And the first is combo therapy. Really in, in 2019, most people who quit, if they're gonna use NRT, they should use two, two NRTs. They should be encouraged to use two NRTs. It works better. They'll have a, they'll have a better experience there, um, in terms of urges and cravings and withdrawal symptoms, et cetera. And it's, it's been shown in multiple trials to be safe and effective. Second, um, if you're gonna use a single agent, it really makes sense to strongly consider varenicline. Um, and as I said, I have no relationship to um, the manufacturer of varenicline, uh, et cetera, or any other pharma pharmaceutical company. This is solely based on really the Cochrane meta-analyses and other meta-analyses that have been done of multiple trials around this. Um, the, I'll talk a little more about why we think varenicline probably is more effective in a couple slides. And the other one is adding coaching and counseling. This is, this is really underutilized uh, currently, and there are many more possibilities for how people can get this now than there were uh, 10 years ago. And I'll talk more about a couple of those. And then lastly, and this is just, this is probably less impactful, but it, it may be useful because it gives people a little more sense of autonomy around how they quit. <clears throat> we used to tell people, don't start your NRT until you, the, your quit day, because we were worried people would overdose on, on NRT if they did it with cigarettes. We even told people if you smoked a cigarette, you should take your patch off. All of this stuff is really out the window. And in fact, there, the evidence is strongly suggestive that you'll do even better if you put your patch on a week or two weeks before you quit rather than waiting until the day that, that you quit. Um, and then people usually uh, will cut down a little on their cigarettes so it's less dramatic. This is just a shot of a Cochrane, uh, the, uh, official Cochrane um, summary, there's high certainty evidence that using combo NRT rather than a single form increases the chance of successfully quitting smoking. Now, just a few more words about varenicline. It's a really interesting mo molecule. It, it's kind of a designer drug that was built off a, a drug, cytosine, that is present in, um, it was like a herbal plant uh, drug used in Eastern Europe for many years to help uh, people quit. And, and it was, it, the molecular composition was changed a little to make it do a couple things even better. And what it is, is it's an alpha-4, beta-2, nicotine, acetylcholine receptor uh, partial agonist. Wow, that was quite a mouthful for this early in the morning. Um, so what it does is it, it competes with nicotine uh, at the alpha-4, beta-2, uh, nicotinic acetylene, acetylcholine receptor, uh, which is the one, and most of these are associated with, with the release of dopamine. Um, so um, it, it, by, by, uh, if it's present without nicotine, i.e. when somebody quits, then that means it reduces nicotine withdrawal because it has about a 50% of the effect that nicotine does on, on the receptor in terms of opening it up. So, so you're, it's like having a little bit of nicotine on like the NRT. So it makes you less withdrawal, less cravings, but the other thing it does, which I think is much is fascinating and interesting, is, is that it, um, it, 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 its presence makes it harder for nicotine to create the things that people get when they haven't smoked a lot, which is a, a big rush, a, a buzz, a pleasurable feeling from smoking. So we think that that's why varenicline is probably more effective than other, the other medicines at inhibiting relapse because people just, you, you're all excited, you're, you wanted to have a, a cigarette and then you have it and it's not that big a deal on varenicline. You don't, it, it's like, so why was I so excited about doing this? So it, it has, a, it, it diminishes the probability of relapse. So just a couple other points about varenicline and there's actually a mistake on this slide. I, I confess I discovered last night. You should begin it a, a week before somebody's quitting, instruct somebody 
And then it's the dose is increased gradually in three day increments, starting with a 0.5 half milligram once a day for three days, 0.5 uh, BID for three days, and then the next one is the mistake on the slide. It should say one milligram BID um, starting. Now, the thing about Vreniclin is there's a lot of stuff that people had been worried about the first three or four years that it came out. There was stuff about um, neuropsychiatric effects, maybe suicidal ideation. All of that is, there was even a black box warning for several years. The FDA took that off because a big trial with 8,000 people was conducted no difference in neuropsychiatric events between people getting placebo or getting the active drug. Same with cardiovascular. Um, there was some concern about cardiovascular events. These all just turned out to be, I think, essentially an anecdotal incidents that were reported. It's the other thing to remember about is withdrawal is a significant event that people have when they quit smoking. So they have a lot of symptoms and side effects just from quitting smoking that get mixed up with meds. So at any rate, they stopped. They took those off. Those really are not of concern with, with varenicline. The thing that is a concern with varenicline is that it, it has essentially GI side effects. Maybe a third of people will experience GI side effects, and that's why it's tapered up slowly at the beginning. Is so people get The good news is people tend to get used to it, but if they're not aware that this may happen, um, they, may not, they, may, they may stop using it. They may not be compliant with continuing. Uh, it, the other big trick is to have people take it before meals rather than after. And if necessary, you can cut back down on the dose or go up more slowly if people have them, or use the other kind of usual and customary things that would be done for nonspecific uh, nausea. It can cause constipation as well, same thing, just usual. Now, I just wanted to address a couple of myths and barriers. Around, you know, why are only a third of people or less than a third of people using meds when they quit? So the first one, and this is probably the biggest one, is we've done a really good job of educating people about NRT being, or excuse me, nicotine being the, the most worrisome agent in, in uh, cigarettes. What we haven't done a good job is explaining to them that the reason for that is because it makes you get addicted to them and, and use them for the rest of your life. But that it's the ingredients in the smoke, cigarette smoke, the hundreds of toxins that really cause the most but not all of the physical problems associated with smoking. So a lot of people think they should avoid it. And that leads not only to them not using it, they think that cold turkey is both safe, and then they also think that cold turkey is better because if you quit using your willpower, you're more likely to succeed and stay succeeded, which is not an re unreasonable thing to think. It just happens that there's no evidence that it makes any difference. People who quit for six months using varenicline or NRT or bupropion have at least as good an odds of staying quit as somebody that did, did cold turkey. The other one is it, it, it gets people into a mindset that less medicine equals better, safer. So people, particularly if they're using short-acting NRTs, will try to limit how much they use, which is exactly the opposite of what they should be doing. They should be more proactive about using a short-acting NRT before an urge or craving gets out of control. And then the last one, is, is cultural that people associate doing counseling with, I, I have to be quote unquote crazy, meaning like I have to have a diagnosis of severe depression or anxiety or schizophrenia. And if I start doing counseling, people are gonna think that's, you know, there's something like that going on with me. We've done a lot of work over the last 10 years to try to um, normalize getting this. We, 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 call, we frequently call it coaching rather than counseling or getting help or getting support. So more people are, are doing it, but it's a very important thing that, to normalize the idea that you're, you don't have to do this because you're quote unquote crazy or because you're depressed or you're even stressed. It just helps you quit smoking because they'll teach you a bunch of cool things that you didn't know about how to do it that work. Now I'm gonna take a little digression here, um, which could be a bottomless pit that I regret. Um, and, and that's so I, I figured I should just tell you a little bit at least about uh, what, what we're thinking about vaping in, in all this use of e-cigarettes and vaping, which is obviously a huge phenomenon. I, I'm gonna go through this a little quickly in, because there's a few other things I wanna make sure I talk about. So the first thing is, does vaping or using e-cigarettes, does it work like an NRT? Is it something that can be used uh, to help smokers quit? And the answer is, there's only been one study 
that can the word good could be associated with. There have been three or four studies that have been done, but three the only this one even approaches something that you would think of for uh, thinking about a medication. And I'm going to run you through that study in a couple slides. But the short answer is we're not sure probably in some circumstances, if it's literally treated the same way that an NRT was, i.e. people get counseling, they use it um, with supervision and instruction, it could probably work. But there's other things about it that we're worried about. Helping people quit vaping, uh, especially with the um, e-cigarette vaping associated lung uh, illnesses that we've, the epidemic that we've been experiencing over the last three months, there's been like, quadrupling of calls to quit lines and other places saying, hey, can you help me quit vaping because I'm, I'm worried about it. But I, can't, I tried to quit and I can't because lo and behold, people are addicted to vaping. And unfortunately, the bad news is there ain't nothing that we know about this specifically. Nobody has done a trial of a, of a vaping intervention. There's a, a number of things that have sort of been tossed together uh, NCI's smokefree.gov has a section on vaping. There's another uh, website, BecomeNX, that has a, um, a texting program for vaping. But none of these have been studied. They're all just extrapolations from what we know works around cigarettes. And then the last is the effects on youth and uh, young adults of uh, what's happening with their nicotine use because of the introduction of vaping. And the short story is it's an expletive deleted disaster especially since Juul was introduced two, years, two or three years ago. There's, there's been like nothing that has been seen in the last 50 years, just going from you know, 0% of adolescents using these things to more than 20 or 30% of them using them with, a, with an 80% increase in one year period after Juul was introduced. Um, and again, these are addictive products with nicotine equal to or greater than the amount present in cigarettes. Very few people think it's in the interest of an adolescent to become addicted to nicotine if they wouldn't have otherwise, but clearly this is starting to happen, as I will show you in this slide, which shows you, um, this is just everybody in this are people that are using e-cigarettes, adults. And white means that you're using an e-cigarette and you're a current smoker. So in the United States, 60% of the people who are using e-cigarettes are also smoking. So that's, that doesn't fit with the recipe of the enthusiasts around e-cigarettes is, hey, this is just going to make the whole population quit smoking because they're all going to switch to e-cigarettes. But 60% of them are, are doing what we call dual use. And then also really disturbing, if you look at 18 to 24-year-olds, there's almost as many people who are never cigarette, they've never smoked a cigarette. There's almost the same as current smokers, and there's only a tiny number of former cigarette smokers. So the, the population effects of e-cigarettes here are very worrisome over the long term, uh, if de depending on kind of what happens and it's hard to predict. I'm not gonna run through all of these, but this is just the list of the possible harms. The possible benefit is that adults will quit or switch, but the possible harm is nicotine addiction in adolescents, check, this is happening. Discourage smokers from using proven quit methods, check, this is happening. As e-cigarettes have gone up, the use of NRTs, the the, the the consumption of them has gone down. Long-term dual use pattern rather than quitting, check. I just showed you the slide that showed that's what's happening with 60%. Acute toxicities, uh, uh, nobody thought really was quite sure this would happen, but now it has happened. There are a, a thousand people that have gotten the uh, lung illness associated with these cigs and vaping and uh, over, a, uh, I think around a dozen at this point deaths. Um, but I'm not, I'm mildly worried about that. What really worries me is the uncertain long-term exposure risk. We just don't know. And anybody who tells you that they know uh, is enthusiastic or something because we don't have the science to do this. We, there are a number of things that are quite worrisome. There have been studies in animal studies around effects on the endothelial lining, effects on inflammation. Um, and and the, the biggest probably concern is that there's something about the agent, the aerosolized agent that's and, and exposure to very fine particulate matter, where it may not matter what the, what's in it. Clearly, cigarettes have a lot less of the toxins, but they, they have a, they have more than cigarettes. They expose people to very uh, high levels of fine particulate. And, and we, we think, for instance, that that may be why their cardiovascular risk appears to be 
equal to cigarettes or, and, and it's additive. If you use e-cigarettes and, and smoke cigarettes, you, your risk is higher than if you only smoke cigarettes for cardiovascular things. So there's a lot of stuff like that that's just beginning to get sorted out. Um, I think that's, it's also we're worried because it's just making, the, 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 you know, the tobacco industry was kind of on a, a death spiral uh, five years ago around use in industrialized countries. And this is um, re, re-energizing them and, and they're able to do things around running ads and all this kind of stuff that were outlaw, out, outlawed 20 years ago um, and they're just doing it. So it's, it's wild and crazy. So in summary, there's limited evidence that they would work as effective aids. I am gonna show you this, this one study. Um, they're not currently approved as an FDA medication. We don't know the long-term effects. They're definitely not safe for a bunch of subpopulations. But the one other thing I will say, which I think we've not emphasized enough in the public health sphere, is that if you are using any, if you're only using e-cigarettes, stopping that and going back to smoking cigarettes is an incredibly bad idea because 1,200 people a day die from using uh, cigarettes. It's a known harm that's really, really bad. So no one should be encouraged to do that. And, and no one should even, it, it should be thought to. So just the last thing I'm gonna do is just quickly run you through this very recent interesting study that was done uh, in the UK with almost a thousand uh, smokers who are highly motivated to quit. This is one of the caveats. And they used a, they were randomized to get either a, a, a third generation tank vaping, vaping system. So a very sophisticated model, more sophisticated than most that are used uh, versus whatever kind of NRT they'd like to use. And they got, the, the other important caveat is they all got at least four weeks of face-to-face -face counseling, which about 2% of smokers who are trying to quit get in the US, maybe 3%. So this was the, this was the Cadillac of population and the Cadillac of intervention. Now, the good news was the quit outcome at 12 months was the people in the e-cigarette group did better, eight absolute percentage points, 18% uh, versus about 10% in NRT. So that's, that, that was something to think about. And therefore the potential for some of these agents, particularly the tank agents, to, to be used as a cessation aid should not be dismissed. It's, a, it's a, this one study that's, that's, that encourages it. However, there's one caveat the authors didn't really emphasize. They reported it, but they didn't emphasize. And that's that how many people at 12 months were still using the product that they were randomized to? 80% of the people in the e-cigarette group were still using the e-cigarette at the, at the end of, uh, long past the quote unquote end of treatment only 9% of those in NRT. So if your interest is, is in getting people off nicotine, clearly the NRT was actually superior. But if your interest is, is purely in getting people off cigarettes, then the uh, vaping product was superior. Okay, I'm gonna um, jump back to these buckets and I'm probably gonna have to skip some stuff because I wanna leave some time for questions. But um, what can we do in the healthcare system? The the, the model that was produced over about 20 years is this thing called the 5A model. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. It's pretty obvious we do it for other things. Uh, it's just you inquire, usually the medical assistant or whoever rooms a patient would inquire about their tobacco use. Brief advice would be given uh, as your doctor. I strongly encourage you to quit smoking. I think it would be one of the best things you could do for your health, boom. And then what do you think? Are you you assess, are you interested in quitting or not? And if they, if they are not interested, I'll show you what we propose to do. If they are, then you would offer them some kind of assistance with quitting. Talk a little bit yourself or, and or refer them to the quit line, to somebody else. If there was something in the healthcare system, somebody else that could help arranging follow-up. Now there are shorter variations on this, like ask, advise, refer, because even though this isn't very much, it's, it's, usually, it's often too much. So refer people to uh, a quit line or refer people to a, a group, et cetera. Um, if person's not ready to quit, that doesn't mean there's nothing to be done because we know that in some ways, this is where a, a clinician can play the most powerful role is in, in, is in uh, exploring ambivalence. You, so you're not interested in quitting. I'm curious because you came in to see me. This is the third time I've seen you for bronchitis. 
Why are you not? Oh, you, you didn't realize this was associated with smoking. Well, let me tell you, blah, blah, blah. Um, so there's a lot to do in this space uh, that, that increases the probability that people will become more interested in, in quitting. Um, we, we actually think there's, it's, there's less of a distinction. Even these people, it can be helpful to explain to them about treatment options because they, they may, people can switch very quickly between being interested and not interested. I'm not going to go into detail around this. The, the short story is this basic approach I just outlined has been studied in all of these environments, outpatient, including primary care and specialty, inpatient settings, lung cancer screening, pharmacy, dental office, behavioral health. It works in all of them. So there's really no place where smokers are flowing through a clinic system where they, they will not benefit by being system, having their smoking status systematically addressed. That being said, there's a lot of challenges to doing this in the, in the, the life of what, what, what's going on. There's still reimbursement issues. Let me talk a little more about that. There's not a good place to refer people to other than perhaps the quit, a quit line. But other than that, it's, it's hard to find places to refer people. We don't have enough, there's not enough time, although time can be made for this, but it's a challenge. People aren't trained enough, the systems don't back it up, and it's not culturally as exciting as doing, you know, having technologies that, that like slit lamps and CTs and all these other cool things. There's nothing like that with smoking. Um, there are lots of things that, that help to do this. I would actually, even mentioned the, the bottom one here, it can be fun and rewarding because as long as you remember that if you get one person to quit smoking, you just added you know, eight to 10 years to their life expectancy and you can communicate that to them, that's pretty satisfying because there's not a lot of things like that that, that are, are done in a day. All these kind of things we know work, they work for everything, but they also work specifically for smoking, integrating it into clinic workflow so it's not a one-off, using the EHR, having e-referrals so, so you don't have to do some weird other process, having it a team sport, not just the clinician working on this and using the usual kind of QI tools to make it work. Now, I'm just gonna talk for a minute about quit lines because I think this is very important to know in Washington State. Washington State has had a rocky road around its particular quit line. There's all 50 states have quit lines. They vary widely in services available. We happen to be in a moment where Washington State is a little bit better than it has, so anybody who calls this number will get some service, and a lot of people will get a lot of service, um, which was, was not true a year ago. Um, the evidence based around quit lines is very, very strong. Cochrane Review, uh, sort of grade A, that, that, and the, the more you get, with, you can get proactive counseling when people call. Uh, people are highly trained to deliver this uh, services to folks. So, so it's really a, a kind of an under the radar service in Washington state. And in Washington state, you are some of the few people in the state of Washington that know this, but as a clinician, you can refer patients through the, a web portal to them and they will proactively call your patients. You have to kind of sign up online. I'll, I'll show you the resource for it, but it's quite cool. There's many other things like websites, uh, mobile texting, uh, and mobile apps, all of which have some evidence for effectiveness, but not as strong as quit lines. Insurance is kind of a still, it's gotten a lot better than it was 10 years ago, uh, but there's still variability between Medicare and Medicaid and different private insurances. So it's very uh, frustrating. Hypothetically, all private insurers should have to cover uh, all the medications and counseling because that's what the Affordable Care Act said, but uh, it's quite variable in implementation. I'm going to just jet through this. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I think I'm incredibly going to jet through this. Basically, smoke-free um, smoke laws have made a huge difference, increasing the price of tobacco, mostly through taxation, and uh, media has made a big difference. Um, and then I'm just going to close with, a, um, with one more ad by Terry, uh, uh, Terry Hall in the TIPS campaign and talk a little about the TIPS, uh, what, why we know this is as amazingly effective as it was. Of course, in order to do this, I will need to, let's see, am I, see if this works. This is her most famous ad, first ad she did. I'm Mary, and I used to be a smoker. I want to give you some nothing about getting ready in the morning. Modern 
And now you're ready for the night. Okay, so we put a lot of work into this. We spent like millions of dollars doing this first federal campaign ever done uh, in 50 years since the Surgeon General's report, amazing. Um, how do we know it worked? Well, you know, we, we, we looked at people calls to quit lines. Each of the colored things is when the campaign was in the air. And as you can see, it obviously reliably was causing increases in quit line calls which increases, if people called, it increases the probability of success. But that's not all that was done. For every one person that called the quit line, we'd say a, a probably 10 people made a, a, an independent quit attempt. How do we know that? Well, we studied it. We, we uh, did a, interviews of thousands and thousands of smokers and non-smokers before the campaign and then at the conclusion of the campaign. And based on changes in quit attempt rates, we made estimates based on the census that about one and a half million people per campaign made quit attempts that would not otherwise, which translates to about 100,000 people quitting uh, permanently. The campaign's now been running for about seven years, so it's about a million people that the campaign has probably helped uh, motivate successfully to quit. You, there are things that are available from the campaign uh, that can be used in the doctor's office. I'm not gonna belabor that. Instead, I'm just gonna conclude with the following four points. <laughs> Tobacco use remains the leading preventable cause of disease and disability and death in the United States, despite all the progress we've made, which is amazing. Um, it, it works to think of it as a, more like a chronic relapsing disorder than as a, a wellness issue or something like that. If, you, if we use the tools that we know to use for diabetes, et cetera, uh, a lot of things just fall out naturally. Combo med, um, medication plus counseling, and if a single agent, varenicline, uh, most people should be offered those things. And there's a bunch of health system stuff that can be done to make all this stuff happen more routinely. And with that, do we have time for a little bit of questions? Absolutely. Thank and I've got a, this list, which I'm leaving up while we're talking. This is a, a resource list. I apologize for the fact that the government does not have the sense to get really short URLs if they want people to use them. But I apologize. Maybe Google search is a better bet, but if you're really inspired, you can try to write these down. All right, thank you, Dr. McAfee. So thanks so much. That was a great talk. Could you, when a patient says, well, thank you. If a patient asks, how long should I be on varenicline, or how long do you think I'll need it, or when should I try stopping it? What, what should we tell them? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, it, they, I, I think the short answer would be that they, they should that plan on 12 weeks. Uh, there's a subset of people who it's been pretty well established, they will gain some benefit by going longer, for, by going essentially uh, for 24 weeks or six, six months. There's no evidence, although they've done some trial, there's not evidence that going longer than six months is beneficial. Um, uh, although I wouldn't rule it out on a case by case basis based on you know, clinical judgment, but probably a majority of people will do well, are the, the, the benefit that you drive from the three months to six months is smaller than the benefit that you get for the first three months but is, is pretty established. And again, the reason that we would say this about varenicline and not about the other medications is because of this effect on relapse prevention. That's probably, that's how it's acting in, in the longer period. Do people taper it? They don't, there's, there's not a tapering regimen, no. Thank you yes. for a great talk. Um, you've shown us the data about health benefits from quitting tobacco, but I feel like I haven't really heard much about any studies that have looked at just decreasing the amount of tobacco that's been used. Do you, are you aware of any oh, data around that? that's a fantastic question, and thank you for mentioning it. I probably had something buried about that, but I didn't mention it. This is a really important point, especially around e-cigarettes. Because of this whole issue of dual, dual use, that a lot of smokers who are, who are dabbling in e-cigarettes are thinking, well, hey, because smokers are always looking, is there something I can do that's e sort of like quitting but isn't quitting, where I can keep smoking but I reduce harm? A majority of smokers, for sure, that's, the first, that's their first gambit around these things. So they're thinking, well, I'll, I'll use five e-cigarettes a day and I'll cut out five cigarettes or I'll use e-cigarettes and I'll cut, out, I'll cut out five cigarettes. And the, this was studied in, I think, five Surgeon General's reports back, 
where they, they looked at an evidence review around the, the benefit of, of reduction, of cutting down on cigarettes. And unfortunately, and somewhat counterintuitively, because we know if you go up, there's a dose response. You know, like if you, if you smoke five cigarettes a day all your life versus 20, there's a big dose response. It doesn't work that way. If you've been smoking 20 years and then you, then you cut down from 20 to 10, you don't cut your risk in half. And, and we think some of this has, has to do with damage that was done and then it can be sustained with very low levels. Plus, like for some risk factors like cardiovascular uh, is, is less of a dose response. Even a, a cigarette a day gives you a, a big boost in cardiovascular risk. So for whatever reason, it, it, it really is a, probably a disservice to encourage or accept reasoning about, well, I did cut down from two packs a day to one and a half packs a day, something like that. It's different to ask, there's a more complicated question about what about people who cut down as a strategy? And there, there's not really evidence that pure cutting down increases your chances of being successfully quit, unless it's done in the context of like starting NRT early or something like that. But, but, but if you cut, if somebody wants to cut down how many cigarettes they smoke over a couple of week period, that's fine and dandy. They can do it. Again, I would say, well, if you want to do that, do it. There's not evidence that it'll help. But if you feel more in control to do that, you're worried about blah, 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 that's fine. Okay. Yes. Why do people in lower socioeconomic classes have higher smoke rates than people in higher SEC? Why do they? Wow, that's a good question. I, I think there's several reasons. One of them has to do with um, essentially increased vulnerability to the um, the promotional tactics of the tobacco industry, so that they're they're more susceptible to the ad, to advertising and marketing and product placement than people in, in higher socioeconomic status. And 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 people so so they're the environment in low SES neighborhoods tends to be more saturated with convenience stores that are making their money off selling tobacco and alcohol, but particularly tobacco. Um, and um, all those things, we, and they, we know they make people more susceptible both to, to getting hooked, but also to, to maintaining hooked, uh, maintaining it. Uh, having said that, and then there's also, a, there's been a policy failure. Like if you think of the states, like if you think of, I mean, don't let somebody from Kentucky or West Virginia hear me say this perhaps, but perhaps Kentucky and West Virginia might be more akin to somebody, an individual with low SES status than somebody let, than you might think about Washington state uh, or California. And those, they have less policies. So areas that have a, a, a lower SES have tended to have poorer uh, implementation of tobacco policy status, of tobacco policies that we know work. Um, now, paradoxically, you know, like people that are low SES are more price sensitive um, than, than, than higher SES. So you would think that, that like the price increases would have done this. And, but so some of it is, it also, it, I think it requires a kind of discipline. This is less around SES and more around education because of course they correlate. So people that with higher education have, have been given a set of tools around uh, delay gratification and thinking through and, and taking serious things that might not happen for 10 or 20 years, which is harder for people in low SES to do naturally, I think. But again, some of that's uh, speculative. Great. Time for one final question. I think. Thank you for a great talk. Um, as a follow-up to that, the disparity data is obviously very disturbing and it mirrors the other big epidemiologic problem that we're facing, which is obesity. Um, do you have any thoughts to why, again, they sort of seem to go hand in hand and then the other, geographically, and the other question I have is a lot of patients I think are concerned when you counsel them for a cessation about weight gain, especially the female population. So what do you tell them? Is there data? This has been looked at, um, and it, it's a good idea to be honest. And the reality is that people's having some fear of of gaining weight when they quit is 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 real because people tend, on average, to gain something like five pounds when they quit, or something like that, uh, for multiple re for you know re reasons that have to do with with uh, 
both probably metabolic change, but also behavioral stuff associated with eating that you're, 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 you may eat to deal with it. Um, as to what to do with that, I, I think it's important to help people put it in perspective because the danger is, there have actually been studies then that tried to do interventions with this. And they actually found that if, if, you, if you do an intervention where you get people to focus, like, hey, weigh yourself every day. Because we know from weight loss that that can help people to not, um, not to help people to lose weight or maintain weight. If you do that with smokers who are quitting, who have some weight concerns, they're less likely to quit smoking. Because what they'll do is they'll see themselves go up a pound or two pounds. They'll say, well, I don't want this to happen. And so they, um, they quit. There's not a medication that helps with weight gain. Bupropion, people were excited about for a while because it, it does have a, it looks like maybe it has a transient effect that keeps people from gaining a couple of pounds. But only once, you, once you're done with the bupropion, it, it, it loses its effect. So there's not a medication solution. I, I think the best thing is to, but, but to just tell people about really the things that can be more dramatic, like, you, you know, you want to make sure people aren't binging, uh, enormously, you know, so it's sort of, it's like a middle path around what watching weight. Now, the other thing is we know that we know that exercise helps people quit. So I, I would encourage encouraging people to exercise. There's not a whole lot of data that's been done around this, but, but, uh, I, I think, you know, we know, since we know exercise is great for people anyway, what's to, what's to lose by encouraging people to exercise? Although again, the same thing, you don't want to set it up. So, well, actually I know quitting smoking is really hard, but let me have you do another thing that's really hard, which is to improve exercise. So you, you don't, you don't want to set anything up to make it, to create barriers, but, but you can, if somebody's worried about it, I would say, well, this is something you could, you could do. The, the larger, the question you asked about, uh, the relationship of, of obesity and smoking is, I, I think it's just that the same, many of the same economic factors, psychological factors, and um, really kind of community neighborhood factors that, that it's, you sell cigarettes in convenience stores and you sell a bunch of junk, junk food and so forth and so on. And, and that's about as the best we know. All right, let's give Dr. McAfee one more. Thank you very much. Thank you.